Praise the Lord. Let me invite you to your feet. We are going to the epistle of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 17 through 18. I can't tell you how grateful I am to see Perry and Bobby here today. We love you guys. We appreciate you so, so very much. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17 and 18. Continuing the summer series on this is our time. It says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Isn't that an interesting statement? The apostle Peter here preparing the church for the return of Christ. He says, the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? In essence, is what he's saying is, is that God has come to reckon with us to get us back into the place of obedience. Notice what he goes on to say. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, it's an incredible statement. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? God says, I'm coming to deal with the church first before I ever deal with the world. Because the world will be lost if the church doesn't get this right. The Lord is counting on you and I. And he's not going to sit on the sidelines of our life journey. No, he's going to show up when he needs to, to get us in the right place of obedience. Because our obedience is how we carry the gospel of this kingdom through the world. And the world needs a fully immersed church. People that are fully devoted followers of Jesus. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you that it brings distinction between me and you between my soul and spirit, between your voice and my voice. Today, Lord, I pray for a grace and an anointing to communicate this word and a grace and an anointing to hear it. We bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 As you're getting your seat, look at someone and say, this is our time. This is our time. Listen, it's my intention to build a bridge between this summer series and the new series that we're going to launch in August, which we've entitled Last Days. Joseph Parker, a 19th century preacher in England, he said this, and I want you to, I want you to hear this and see this. He said, the man whose little sermon is repent sets himself against his age and will be, for the time being, battered without mercy by an age whose moral tone he challenges. There is but one end for such a man, off with his head. The fiery preacher that Joseph Parker was, he said this, the moment that you take the position to preach repentance to a culture that does not want to hear the message, he said, get ready, they're going to come after you. Get ready, they're going to come after you. I feel and know that you've been challenged over the last several weeks where we have determined to have a sensitive spirit towards the voice of the Lord and speak up and say what is necessary to be said. I know that sometimes it can be very challenging to hear it, and for some of you, you don't want to hear it. But I will say this, for those of you that have refused to hear, you're the ones that really need to hear those of you that have thrown up the wall and just, you know, leveraged some kind of response that's not necessarily scripture but more of an opinion, listen, I want to tell you, take down the wall. God needs you and he needs me. He needs us fully devoted to following him according to the scriptures. And we're not going to be able to do that with walls up. We're not going to be able to do that with a limited perspective of who God is. So one of the things that I feel it's being shaken out in us is that God's trying to get a gain, let me say this, get you and I in a better position so we can get a clearer perspective of who he is. Because the life that we live is connected to the perspective of him that we have. And if you don't have the full perspective of who God is, you may live compartment, with compartments in your life, and there may be some of your life that is fully devoted, and you talk about God and your relationship with him in the paradigm of that revelation that you have, but there could be other compartments in your life that are void of his presence, or let me say it like this, of his lordship. 
And those areas will sabotage, contaminate the messaging. And so God has come in this season to help reckon with us and get us into the place that we need to be. Now, why is it so important? Why is a series like this so important? Well, let me just put it in this context. What if we're in a time when Jesus is really going to return? What if this is the season where he's preparing us for his return? What if this is the setup for this great tribulation that's going to shock the entire world? What if we're really living in the last days? If we are, by chance, if we are, if this is the time, then we're a very special generation. We're a very unique people. For 2,000 years, it began with the apostles preaching the return of Jesus, setting expectation in the heart of people, and generation has come and gone. But I promise you this, there is going to be a generation that is going to witness his glorious appearing, that is going to play a significant role in the evangelism of the entire world. What if that's us? If it is, guess what? We need to raise the standard. We, we need to raise the standard. We, we need to live above compromise. We need to live above reproach so that God can leverage us to this lost world, so that the harvest can really be gleaned. Now, obviously, people have come and gone with an expectation for Jesus to return, and truth be, be known, we, it might not be that time. This just might be another birth pain in the process. It's possible. But to be honest with you, this kind of alignment back into the pur purpose and the presence of God, there's no downside. It's only great outcomes, because at the end of the day, if it's not the return of Jesus, we're still going to win people with our lifestyle and our example and bring them into the kingdom of God. Be able to be a light into a darkness. See our sons and daughters return to the kingdom of God. And listen, we need that, right? I can tell you that just from this place of hitting that double nickel today, I mean, think of that. 55. Old. She said, that's young. It don't feel young. It's, hardly, it's hard to come out. But one of the things that I just love about this season is getting to watch my children chase Jesus. Getting to experience the fruit of a faithful relationship with Jesus in my own marriage. It's, it's, it's one of the most beneficial things. And my, 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 my son didn't always serve the Lord. He found God a after his little run. And some of you have your children in their little run. And maybe they're not where they need to be in Christ. But I would like to think that you have a significant part in them getting there. And so, if not for the world, it should be for your family. If not for your neighbor, it should be for those in your own house. That we should want to raise the standard to make sure that God is being properly represented. Somebody say amen. amen. The Apostle Peter is encouraging us to get ready for the return of Jesus in this chapter 4, 1 Peter. He begins, verse 7, he says, the end of all things is at hand. He's coming to say the end of all things is, is at hand, and God's going to start with the house to get the house in order as the end of all things is at hand. God is coming to reckon with us in this season. Why would he do that? Well, let me just say this. We have a tendency to look at the world, and we can be very judgmental and critical of the world. I, I, when we look at what's going on in society, the demonic doctrine that's being facilitated, the ideology that is trying to suffocate the church and draw us into a place of irrelevance, there's so many crazy things that are happening. But just the truth of that is, sinners act like sinners. People in the world act like the world. We shouldn't be surprised. I mean, it can be stunning sometimes at how far our nation has declined in, in its moral standards. But the decline in its moral standards is because of the quietness, or let me say it like this, the decline in the church. And while we should not be surprised at what's taking place in the world, we should be appalled at what's taking place in the church. I believe we have manufactured a God, specifically in this country, but all over the world, quite honestly, that is in our image and in our likeness. We've colored outside the lines and distorted the biblical picture. We've refused to reconcile the whole nature and plan of God into our messages because we don't want people to be offended. That's, don't offend anybody. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Don't want to offend anybody. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to judge anybody. We've watered down the sacrifice of submission and manufactured the gospel of grace that is absent the gospel of judgment and the severity of who God is. We've lost the awe and the fear of the Creator who slayed His own Son on the cross. We promise people a life tomorrow filled with their dreams and their desires. We tolerate the very sin within our ranks 
that God is going to send others to hell for. No, we've allowed the leaven to creep in, and it has leavened the entire lump. We're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God told us not to, and we're asking God to be okay with it, and he's not. We must take action in this season. We must lift the standard. We need the wind of God to blow in a fresh way. We need to take responsibility and quit making excuses. Silence is not an option, Esther, for such a time as this. If I've heard anything from the Lord of late, it has been this. You either say something or I'll raise up a remnant of people who will and I'll remove your lampstand. Sitting on the sideline and trying to patronize people and just go through church services just for the sake of getting through another Sunday is not okay any longer. It wasn't okay then, but it's certainly not okay now. We need some people to turn some tables over in the house of God and say, not on my watch. We're not acting like that. We're not looking like that. We're not going after that. We're... If I could encourage you to add something to your prayer life in this season, it would be this request. Father, make me like the Son. Make me like Jesus. Make me like Jesus. I, I, I pray, I, obviously, I pray and I have a prayer life. And of late, that has just really kept creeping in in a very personal way. The longing to be more and more like Jesus. Not just loving people, but also courage, boldness, forthrightness. And I want you to get this look at Jesus as he's coming into the temple in John chapter 2. In verse 15, it says, and he made a whip of cords. He made a whip of cords and he drove them out of the temple. This is premeditated spanking. Jesus goes to the house of God. He sees what's taking place. He gets over in the corner and he weaves him a belt. And when he's got his belt woven, he goes into the temple, into the house of God, and look, look what he drives. He drives out the sheep and the oxen, pours out the changers of money, overturns their table. He, we would say like this, he threw a country fit on them. I, I guarantee you, he wasn't walking over, he wasn't walking around just like, you guys get up on out here. Oh, if you don't mind, take that outside. Please take that outside if you don't mind. No, the inference is nothing like that. John goes on to say, after the resurrection, we realize that the zeal of his house had eaten him up. Notice what he's driving out. He's driving out the sacrifice. He's driving out what people had used to worship. He's saying, not in my house. You have made this house a den of thieves. And, And basically says, I'm not putting up with it. Get yourself up out of here. Get yourself up out of here. Why would he take such a hostile approach? He was protecting the people that were coming in. He was was looking out for the people that would come to the house of God, and he wanted them to find God when they came, not find a bunch of jacked up people who were acting like they were in love with God, but was trying to molest the people that came in for whatever resource they could exacerbate from them. Hello? Absolutely. If If I was to poll in this place alone, those of you that have suffered church hurt at the hands of Church people, church leaders, there would be a lot of hands that would go up in this place. You just, you just don't talk to a lot of people who have been living a minute that hasn't experienced a church that has not went through a difficult situation. We have mishandled, abused so many people. Sometimes, and it's frustrating for people that they can see your sin, but you can't, and you're trying to judge them for theirs, but you won't deal with your own. And it can be very, it can be very frustrating. I think the church has been living in that for quite some time. And so today, I want to take action. I want to say we need to turn some tables over. But if, if we don't have the right perspective of, the, of, of why we're turning tables over and what the call of God is, then we'll wind up abusing more people. And the truth is, what we need is a revelation of who God is. We need our revelation of him expanded. I love, I feel like there's something on this passage in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3 and 5. I would encourage you to read this in your devotion time. Here it says, and one cried to another. These are these cherubims or seraphims that are flying, these angelic beings. They're flying around the throne of God. And notice this. And they, and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke or the glory of God invaded the house. This house being the temple. Verse 5 says, so I said, this is Isaiah, woe is to me for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. 
And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah gets a revelation, an insight, a vision. And he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And it says that the train of his robe filled the temple. When you really dig into the, the, the language of that passage, Hebraically speaking, the, when it says the train of his robe filled the temple, it means this. It means this. Every crack and crevice of the building was invaded by the presence of God. There wasn't any space in the whole temple that did not have the presence of God within it. And as a result of a full paradigm of who God is, a full picture of his holiness, Isaiah's not being slain in the spirit. He's not doing a Jericho march. He gets a personal revelation of himself. He sees himself when he sees God. Because when you get the proper perspective of God, it should reflect something back to you. Sometimes we're too worried about the experience and not the revelation. The revelation will reveal and provide opportunity for transformation. Experience can make you feel good, but you can return like a dog to his vomit or a pig to its mire. You can go through the experience of cleansing, but you wind up back in the pig pen. Isaiah said, I saw him, and when I saw him, I saw me. Isn't that what 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18 lends itself to? Referencing Moses' experience on the mountain of God when Moses went up into the presence of God and spent this time with the Lord. When he came down, his whole face was shining. He had to put a veil over his face because people couldn't look at him. There's a couple amazing things with that we won't explore today, but one of the things that I love about the story is Moses was unaware that he was shining. Sometimes we're too much aware of our shining. Oh, that's good. I'm meddling right then. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says this, now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom. Where God's spirit is, there's freedom. Notice what he goes on to say. But we all with unveiled face, we don't have a veil over, we're unveiled. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. From glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The role of the Spirit of the Lord is to unveil God so you can get a picture of who he is and see who you're called to be. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is taking away the veil, removing the veil, so that you may experience God and all the freedoms that come along with that. Amen? But the purpose of the invasion is is that God gets every crack and crevice of your life. That his presence takes these temples of the Holy Spirit because God doesn't dwell in buildings made with men's hands, right? The only thing holy in here is you, not the building. Are you tracking with me? But I have a feeling that some of us have compartments that there's no glory in. We have these places in our life because of this limited perspective of God that, 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 that we're still owning and operating and functioning quite well in. It's called the flesh. And we have these other compartments where we have the grace and the love and the revelation of God and we're willing to share that and we love that and we have experiences with him through those things. But this other place, we're not willing to let him in. We're not willing to let go of. And God wants, here you go, all of you, not some of you. And in this season, he's contending for all of you. How we see God, obviously there's some ways in which we see him. I got some scriptures to run, run through. I got a lot of scripture for you today. 1 John 4, 8 says, he who, he who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. The essence of who God is. It's not that God, God loves, God is love. It's part of his essence. We all would agree in that. Psalms 116, verse 5 says, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. I'm grateful for that, right? I haven't received what I deserve. God has given me mercy instead of justice. He's loved me and gave me mercy rather than judged me and gave me justice. Joel 2 verse 13 says, uh, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Anybody grateful for that? If he would have responded when I was being stupid, I'd be like in the grave right now. Right? If he would have responded when I was being stupid... I would have died, but his long suffering, his patience with me, I'm grateful for that attribute. I count on it. 
He's slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. But not only is God these wonderful things, but you know what? He's also holy. Psalms 99.9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Holy. It's the Hebrew word Kadesh. So the angels are looking at God, and they say holy, and they're flying. And it's like every time they move, they get a different perspective, and the word that they express from the perspective is holy. The word holy means, it, it, it denotes the highest standard, but yet it's limited in vocabulary. It means more than. It's like the only word that I could think about is holy, but God, you're more than that. Holy, but you're more than Holy. You're so much more. And every perspective lended this perspective of God's holiness and his goodness in which if you and I are not reflecting that, except you be holy, you shall not see God. Heavy stuff. Psalms 89, 14 says this, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice. Justice is a judicial term. Righteousness is basically the character of responsibility. The, if, if, I hate to call it the rules, but it's the, it's the standard in which justice is communicated by God. Because God is a just God. And how he leverages his justice is through his righteousness. That's how it, he, he don't alter the righteousness in order to give justice. He gives justice consistently with his righteousness. His righteousness is his standard. It's like for you and I, if we're called righteous, it means we're in right standing with God. We come into the right position of God. And we do that by faith in Christ. Psalms, uh, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 12, 29 says this, for our God, here you go, is a consuming fire, an attribute of God, meaning he will consume. He's a consuming fire. Psalm 77 uh, verse 11 says, God is a just judge. God is a just judge because he judges again righteously. God is a just judge. Nonetheless, he's a judge. He sits on the throne and he dispenses judgment. The next part of that verse, I, I want you to hear as well. And God is angry. God can get angry. God is angry with the wicked every day. His anger is not pacified. It's sustained by wickedness. God does not like sin. God God does not like sin. He doesn't tolerate sin. Sin is destructive and a destroyer. And God, as the judge, judges sin from a place of righteousness. Too much for you today? I'm just getting warmed up. We're going to land in a good place, but boy, we're just getting the fuel in the tank right now. So judgment, this is what I want to encourage you, judgment always starts with God's people first. Before God's ever going to deal with the world, he's going to deal with his people. So Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That every one of us must give an account of what we've done in this body. It matters what your hands touch, what your mouth speaks, where your feet go. Just because you said the sinner's prayer doesn't relieve you of responsibility of now bringing this body into subjection to God's will and purpose. You know, when you receive Christ, it is an indication that you have died and nevertheless you live, but the life you live now, you don't live according to the flesh, but you live it according to God's purpose and plans in Christ. And that requires some attack on yourself. That that, that requires you to beat your body and bring it into subjection to the Lord. That means that requires for you to use the spirit to arrest the flesh that the spirit can have dominance in your life, walking by the spirit, not the flesh, so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, which contaminates the witness that the spirit wants to bring out of your life. For you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so God sends his spirit to take your flesh hostage. And as you surrender to the voice of the spirit, he leads you in a way of encounter so that God's good name could be experienced by others who do not know him. So we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then, of course, there is the great white throne judgment that will take place after that in Revelations 20, 11, where those who were not believers or followers in Jesus that have denied the faith 
will be resurrected and stand before God and sentenced ultimately to hell. Some people are going to streets of gold. Some people are going to eternal fires. And your God is responsible. That paradigm has been watered down. And because it's so been watered down in the house of God, there's no fear of the Lord in the house of God. So therefore we become comfortable with sin. And I'm going to tell you this, what one generation does in moderation, the next will do in excess. So we, we, the church is all up in arms. Let, let, let me help you. The church is all up in arms over LGTBQ plus kind of agenda, right? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be pushing back on the darkness that is trying to destroy this next generation. But it started because the church got comfortable with fornication. And the church got comfortable with adultery. And so all along, used to the church that took a hard position. Used to, nobody lived together before they got married. You got married. My son called me. He, 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 he didn't call. He's like, I think I'm going to move in with this girl. I said, boy, if you love her enough to go to hell for her, you better marry her. You love her enough to go to hell over her, you better marry her. If not, you just better text. I'm coming today. When we open the book of Revelation, before God dispenses his plugs, uh, plugs, his plagues, his vials, before trumpets are blown, seals are uh, seals loosened, he deals with the church. Let me, let me set the table like this. It's called the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of revelation is not to show us end times in and of itself. It's not just to show us last days. The book of revelation is to give us the perfect picture of who Jesus is. Because before the writing, we have a lamb slain from the foundation who died on a cross and God resurrected. And so we have a lamb denoting servitude to the cause of Christ, I mean, to the cause of God to make atonement for the sins of the world. The book of Revelation builds upon the lamb who was a servant and now introduces us to the lion who's going to be the ruler and the king over it all. It begins to describe for us these attributes in, its, in, John, uh, in John's limited language like Isaiah here in holy that is a limiter because God is more than I can express. The book of Revelation is the same way. John is looking at Jesus and he's like this. He said, well, his hair is white like as wool. It, 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 it's it's, it's, it's whiter than wool, but wool is the, the only word I know to describe. His eyes are like as a flaming fire. They were so piercing and so they were like fire eyes, but it's like he has limited language. But his purpose is, is to draw us into a perspective of who Jesus is as not only the lamb, but and the lion as well. Not only the sacrifice, but the king and ruler over all creation. And for you and I, we need this revelation of our conquering king so that we can align our lives to present. He's already died and we've received the atonement. Our job now is to start aligning with the lion who is soon to return so that we can turn over the kingdoms of this world that they can become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. We have a role to play to take the lamb and use his atoning work to apply to the sins of humanity so they can meet the king when he comes one day. That's our participatory place in this earth. You have a place and a role to play. So when John comes out, he's describing Christ in this beauty and splendor. And then Jesus says to him before he gets to the judgment of the world, I need you to talk to the church first. Because judgment always begins at the house of God. So when we open up Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's seven churches in Asia Minor that he is specifically going to start dealing with. And he's not holding back. He's not holding back. He's not driving. He's not like, oh, you guys, you're going to get it one day. You're just working on a testimony. You just keep at it. You just hold on. I'm going to take your mess ups and I'm going to turn it for good for you. Oh, he ain't talking like that at all. He coming out the gates blazing. I mean blazing. If, check that. The, the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 verse 4. Nevertheless, I got something against you. 
Hey, let me modernize it. I got issues with you. Now, he's speaking to the church. He says, I've got issues, but nevertheless, I've got something against you. You've left your first love. You're not doing this out of relationship. You're doing it for personal benefit. You're not in the right place. Your heart's not in the right place in this. You're going through the motion, but there's a detachment from love. And his, his encouragement of recovery is simply this. It's simply this. Repent. I need you to repent of this. I need you to get your life back in line. I have a feeling he's talking to us that way. Verse 14 of the same chapter, he's talking to the church at Pergamos. He's like, I got a few things against you. I had one against them. I got a couple more against you. I have a, I, I have a few things against you because, because you have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam who have taught Balak to be a stumbling block before Israel. Woo, that's an accusation. Well, let me back up. That's not an accusation. That's a statement of fact when it's coming out of Jesus' mouth because he's not an accuser. He's saying you are allowing teaching that is consistent with how Balaam and Balak caused the children of Israel who were standing in the blessed position to compromise their blessed position and cause many people to fall as a consequence of that, which was they started allowing sexual promiscuity to run amok in the camp. Everything goes. There was no boundaries on sexuality as long as you loved one another. What was the outcome? Verse 16, repent. I need you to repent. Jesus speaking to the church before he deals with the world. Thyra, Tyra, same thing. I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, oh Jezzy right there, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I tell you, I've seen one of the most disturbing things as I watched the National Assembly of a denomination this past week and every person that got up and addressed the National Assembly got up in their political correct nature wanting to be prefer, pronoun preferred to as uh, they, them, he, she. I, I thought, what is wrong with you? Listen, it's not acceptable. Let me say it again. That does not reflect Jesus. Jesus called them male and female. He's not confused with who you are. He knows exactly who you are. You are who he made you to be. You're not a mess up. You're not broken. Let me, let, 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 let me help because I know there's a lot of argu- uh, arguments about being born this way, right? Being born this way. There's only XX and XY chromosome, Period. Period. And you could be a Supreme Court justice in this day and say, I don't know how to define a woman. I'm not a biologist. You ain't got to say nothing. I know. Can people be born as homosexuals? Can people be born as adulterers? Can people be born as liars? Yes. Yes, you're born in sin and shapen in iniquity. And when you come out the womb, you have the proclivity to do a number of all kinds of sadistic things. There's no good thing in the flesh. You are born with a nature that does. Some people gravitate to one thing over the other. Some people don't gravitate to men and men, but they gravitate to a lot of women while they're married. It's all the nature of sin that is born in us. And you know what the solution of the nature of sin is? Jesus, who comes to break the nature of sin and... Right? Yeah. So we're born with the capacity to do anything and everything under the sun. I'll agree with my adversary quickly. Yeah, you were born that way, but you need delivered from it. All right. I'm, I'm moving on. I'm meddling bad now, right, aren't I? Church of Sardis, same thing. Got issues with you. You're, you're people that testify that you're alive, but you're really dead. Hold fast and repent. It's the same thing over and over that he's speaking to the church. You're allowing all this conduct to go on among you. I need you to repent. I need you to get this right. I need you to come out of that sinful behavior. I believe God is calling us as a body in this season to get out of our sin. To get out of our sin. To to, to take those compartments that we've been hiding our sin in and allow God's presence to get in and re-identify us. Bring out of who we really are. Let our witness be seen. In his book, Why Revival Terries, which I would 
encourage every person in this room to read by Leonard Ravenhill. He wrote a section in chapter 12 called The Prodigal Church in a Prodigal World. And he said, if I had to put the church in a category, it wouldn't be Ephesus or Laodicea, I mean, excuse me, or Smyrna or, or Pergamos, it would be Laodicea. He said, I see the church as a picture of Laodicea in this season. Because the church is saying, I'm rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. But yet the perspective of God, I think, largely on the body of Christ is we're poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. Uncovered is what that meant. Laodicea was an amazing town, town center. It sat at the crossroad of one of the, most major, of the biggest intersection in Asia. It was a, a huge trading route, a very wealthy city. Very, very wealthy. Well, it was one of the financial capitals of that, that part of the world. Gold was purified there. It was traded as people came through. It, it, it had the market on black wool. The designer clothing of Laodicea was everybody dressed in black. It was, it was the affluent dress, if you will. Modern uh, medicine development was just, uh, a school of medicine they actually had there, was just really going forward well. They had even created something that was for the eyes, that was helping people that were dealing with problems in their eyes. It was, a, it was a major resource. But when Jesus comes, he's saying, I see you saying all this, but that's not really where you're at with me. And then he describes a spiritual condition for them. He's, he says, you guys are neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. And he said, this current position, if you don't change it, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, let me just tell you again, he's talking to a church. Let me put it in context. He's talking to a church that had access to the apostles, the first witnesses. These are the people that went into these cities and great demonstration of power established these churches. This is not hundreds of years later. This is in the first century. So, so this ain't like 2,000 years later and we've got all this working, if you will. No, this is the word of God being planted and started and he's coming and saying, you're in a lukewarm condition. And why did he call them lukewarm? Just a historical context in this. Hierapolis was a, a region about 15 miles north of Laodicea. And it was known for all these hot springs. They're still there today. All kinds of hot springs. And people would come all, from all over the known world to get in these hot springs and, and, and be able to partake in their healing waters. They was full of minerals and people would go bathe in these hot springs. To the south of them was where Colossa was. Colossa, where Paul wrote the letter to the church of Colossians. And, and Colossa, Colossa, if you will, had great water source from the mountains. When the snow-capped mountains would melt, that fresh, cool water would run down, and it came in proximity of Colossa. So what the Laodiceans wanted to do is they wanted to build this aqueduct system where they would pull the, war the hot waters from the springs down into the city, and then they would pull the cool, refreshing waters into the city. But when they built their piping system, which is still there today if you go to Turkey, when they built the piping system, what happened when they started releasing those hot spring waters into that piping and the material that it was made of, it began to, uh, they didn't mix well. And the waters become undrinkable. Not only were they undrinkable, but what started out as hot, by the time it drained down through the piping system, it got cooled off, it became lukewarm. Same thing was said on their aqueduct system, trying to bring those cool mountain waters into the city of Laodicea. They built this system, but by the time the water, cool, refreshing water of the mountains made it to Laodicea, guess what? They were warm now. And he says, listen, what started out as a stream of refreshing, because, look, look here, and what started out as hot pools of restoration now have become lukewarm. What is he actually saying? He says, what's happened is, is you've moved from the source. You've dislocated, relocated from the source, and now here's what you're trying to do. You're trying to be comfortable. Just like you and I. Like when you lay down at night and you get in the bed, you're looking to be comfortable. And if it's too hot, what do you do? You throw that leg right out of the covers. That leg got cut. What you're trying to do is regulate yourself and find a place of comfortability so you can sleep comfortable. Listen, very few people, and you may be in here, don't raise your hand and mess up my message, but very few people get in the shower and turn on the shower while they're standing under the head. Who does that? Right, nobody does that. I plumbed up my shower just so I can reach into the shower safely and turn the water on from outside the shower. Because you don't want to, yeah, I don't want to get here and try to turn the head over against the wall while I got the water on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
Because that cold water that hits you is not comfortable. And if you let it get too hot, it's not comfortable. That's why you put your hand in it and make sure that it's just right. And Jesus is saying this church has gone to sleep. And you're trying to rest in your materialism and make life all about comfort and convenience. And meanwhile, you have warmed up. You're no longer healing powers and, and restorative powers. And you're no longer a good cool drink for the word. I wish you was back at the source instead of living in between. Are you with me? He's calling them back to proximity. He's not telling them, I, I'm going to spew you out. He's telling them that if you don't get your life turned around, it's not going to work out for you. Today, Christianity is looking for comfort. We're looking for comfort. We're trying to regulate every atmosphere we can so we can be comfortable in it. We don't want to be hated. We want to be liked. We don't want to be talked about wrong. We want to be celebrated. And we're constantly aligning our life in a way for comfortability. And I think along the way, Christ is wounded in the house of his friends. I think that's what's happening. Christ continues to be wounded by us. Zechariah 13, 6 says this, And one will say to him, What are the wounds between your arms? And then he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And you're asking me today, How do we wound Christ? Sin. I think sin becomes the continual wound to him. The unrestrained boundaries that we have grown accustomed to live with. I need to, because it's important to put this word in your heart today. I need to read a few scriptures and I'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. It says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he says this, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, or thieves, greedy people, drunkards, or abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. He's being very clear. Galatians 5, 19 and 21, he says this before he gives us the fruit of the Spirit. He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I've told you before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Very plain language. Because he's reaching for us. He's reaching. He said in Ephesians 5, verse 5 and 6, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God or a kingdom of Christ and our God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Verse 6, he says this, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Guys, I'm just letting you know that's... Every bit as important as John 3, 16. It's, it's the word of God. And so what we need to do is we need to get rid of this sin. We need to get rid of this sin. I'm going to say to you that sin is not your excuse. It's your problem. Being in your flesh is not your excuse. It's your problem. I'm going to say something so bold. You're, you're, you're probably going to be taken back by it. I'm going to say that it is possible for you to get up in the morning, set your affection on things above, walk in an attitude of prayer and fellowship with God, treat people like Christ would during the day, and then get to your bed and lie down in your bed in perfect peace because your mind has been stayed on the Lord at that night and not to sin. I'm telling you that you can get up and you can live a day without sinning. (laughs) I feel you. I feel you. I I feel you in this room. Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Please don't say that. You were a sinner and God's grace came to you and delivered you from sin. Constantly confessing that, well, I'm only human. I sin every day. That's not Jesus's problem. Because his spirit is too weak to deliver you out of sin. That's your problem because you've allowed sin to have rule over you. Am I saying that you're never going to sin? I'm not saying that at all. But I'm telling you this. If you continue in sin, you're in danger. 1 John 3, verse 5 through 7. It says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, speaking of Jesus, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin.
The problem with, is with position. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or know him. There's that compartment again. There's that lack of clarity on the broadness of who God is. And so when you limit your scope of who he is, then you give yourself a pass for your behavior that you think he's okay with. Whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Ne- next verse. I'm going to give you one more verse. Verse 8. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's heavy hitting stuff, isn't it? So we think that we are okay because we sin every day. And if you do sin, let me let you know, we have an advocate with the Father that when I confess my sin, he's faithful and just, here you go, to forgive it. But confession is owning it. It's bringing it up. It's not hiding it. It's not counting on an expression of grace that is unbiblical. Not at all. Not, not, not at all. Let me, let me just bring it home. Hey, Paul said in, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he said, How shall I continue in sin any longer if I'm dead to sin? The only way that you sin is because you still have something alive in you that you have not yet surrendered to him. And when you sin, it is a revelation that it's alive within you So that now you can properly deal with this nature that you have not let his glory, his manifestation come into that compartment of your life. And when you repent, what you do is you're owning, changing mind. This is not good behavior. That's what, that's what it means. I'm turning from this. I'm changing my mind about this behavior and I'm agreeing with God. And so now I'm giving him access to this place. I need you to become Lord. I'm struggling here. And when you invite him into the struggle, he's strong enough to deliver you. He's strong enough to deliver. He can get you off drugs. He can deliver you from... Come on, somebody. So, 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 check it together. James said it like this. He said, when I'm tempted, then I'm drawn away by my own lust. And when I get in agreement with the temptation, that means when I partner, participate with what I'm tempted with, He said, then sin is conceived. Where the two become together, sin is the product, and the fruit of sin is death. So think of that. What he's saying is, is what happens is, the devil will provide, or the world will provide a temptation. The temptation will reckon with you. Now, when the devil came to Jesus, Jesus said, he's coming to me, but there's nothing in me for him. There was nothing that the devil could put in front of Christ because Christ had fully devoted himself to the Father's purpose. Oh, that's so, that's so good. That, that, that's so good. And, and so what happens is when he comes to me and I'm drawn away, it means that I have something in my life that got in agreement with because here you go, I hadn't died to it. See, when you're dead, it means that you have no life to respond to what you're being tempted to. And we're supposed to die to sin, so when temptation comes, it can't draw me away and entice me into this trap that the enemy is trying to keep me in so that I'm not able to be the effective light to the world that is around me. Now, let me contextualize two things, and I'm going to get out of your way. Two two things. Number one is, is that I'm not... I'm not talking about if you sin, you're disqualified. I'm not talking about that either. The, the, the verb tense in 1 John is for he who continually lives in this lifestyle. It's not about having a moment and you fall short in the moment. For a righteous man falleth down seven times in a day, but he gets back up. So when we miss it, well, you know what we do? We get up. We call upon the Lord who restores us each and every time. So I'm not talking about you being perfect. I'm talking about you pursuing him who is perfect that will deal with the nature that sabotages your witness and your effectiveness to the world that is around you. Because when judgment comes, it's to bring you in compliance with the gospel so that the world don't perish that's the end game of God not willing that any should
should perish, but all should come to the saving knowledge of, of Christ. But a, a weak, impotent church cannot be the life source to a lost, dying world. So that's why God is reckoning with us in the season and saying, come out from the world and be separate, says the Lord. He's trying to draw us out. Now let me bring a distinction to you as well. While I believe, according to the word of God, that you can go a day without sinning, not one amen in this whole place. I don't believe we go without temptation. Temptation is a constant, consistent. So so, so let me bring distinction between facing temptation doesn't mean that you're in sin. I'll use a personal story. You're not going to be able to probably take this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So I'm going to... (laughs) I'm going to... Go speak at a rehab facility. With my background, I love going to places like that because I just feel like I'm relevant. So I feel like I got the strategy to get out of it. And so I'm going to, to, to speak at a rehab facility. And prior to getting there, I'm, I'm early. And so I think, man, I'm going to go over to Wendy's. And I'm going to go in. And so I go over to Wendy's and I get my Bible out. And I've got my notes out. And I'm just sitting there at the table. And I'm just leaning in thinking about what I'm going to teach the guys. And, and all of a sudden, I look up out the window of Wendy's. And I see this car coming in. And the, and the, and the window's open. And I can see some black hair like coming out of the window. And my first thought while I'm sitting there is, hey. I had a second thought. You know what the second thought was? I wonder if her bottom looks as good as her top. Oh, don't, don't, don't look at me like that. Don't, don't look at me like that. You don't have to say nothing sitting beside her, but you know what I'm talking about. That was the first thought. Hey, thoughts come and temptations come. Just because I had the thought doesn't mean I was in sin. If a beautiful woman walks by, you got to be blind. Not Hey, girl, you look good. Right? If, uh, this is too much. I know. I'm, I apologize. You've got kids in here. If she walks by and you notice her backside. <laughs> I just had a song come up in my mind. It was like, I like big butts and I can't. I like. I was like, why did that come? Why did that come? Because there's no good thing in this flesh. Look at that. I start talking about it and then uh, the world jumps in and those. Anyway, let me get that back up in here. Hey, hey. Temptation showed up. There it was. Now what am I going to do? The fact that I noticed or I had a thought, I have not yet sinned. But if I'm going to sit there and prop myself up, what's up, girl? Ooh, look, girl. And I start piling the clothes up in my imagination. Now I'm drawn away and enticed because I have this thing in me. But when I seen her and I recognized that I noticed, I stuck my head down. And I thought, glory to God, I'm a man of God. I've got steak at home. That's just hot dogs right now. I'm a man of God. I don't lust. I don't give in to lust. What I started to do, I started speaking to my temptation, who I am based upon who he's called me to. The power of that thing broke loose. And then I didn't even care. I don't know what she looked like. I can't tell you the blue jeans she had on because I no longer cared. He come for me, but he wasn't in me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not saying you're not going to be tested and you're not going to be tried. I'm going to say you have to stand up and push back with who you are in God against that thing that's trying to draw you away. And that's how you win the day. Yeah, you're going to have tribulation. Yeah, you're going to have temptation. But he said, I have overcome the world. And because I have overcome, you can too. The church must rise to the occasion in this moment and be fully devoted to our Lord and Savior. He is worthy. He is worthy of our no. He is worthy of our yes. He is worthy of our surrender. He is He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on, stand to your feet. I gotta quit.